Okay. Welcome back to World of Aerospace. Today, I'm honored to be joined by Dr. Jonathan McDowell. He's an astrophysicist at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. He's the creator of Jonathan's Space Report, which is the go-to source for reliable, independent tracking of satellite launches and space activity. So, Dr. McDowell, thank you for being here. Now, I want to discuss the Jonathan Space Report to, to start. So let's talk about like some of the origins and the purpose. So my first question for you is, what inspired you to start Jonathan Space Report all the way back in 1989? And did you expect it to, it would become one of the most trusted sources of launch data worldwide? Well, no, I mean, I had been making my own lists of satellites mm -hmm. since I was uh, about 13, okay. right? Uh, so since the 1970s. And when I moved to the Center for Astrophysics in 1988, um, I discovered that, you know, the, this, this place had had a really important history early in the space program of uh, informing the public about space and about satellites, but that the people who'd done that had all left. And so we, um, we still got questions from the public uh, and the public affairs people quickly discovered that I was the person to send those questions to. So they would keep sending me these questions from the public yeah. about space, about what was happening. And in kind of self-defense, I started preparing a brief, a weekly brief for them on these are the things you might get questions on this week. This is what's been going on in space. And someone said, that's actually really useful. Why don't you put that on the internet? Uh, I went, well, yeah, okay. I guess maybe four or five other people in the world might be interested. So, uh, and so I started putting it on, this was before the World Wide Web. Uh, uh, it was a thing called Usenet. Uh, and Usenet had this channel called sci.space.news. And so I started posting Jonathan's space report to sci.space.news uh, just to see if, you know, other people were interested. And it was really, you know, just what I had added to my own notes for that week uh, and sharing it with the rest of the world. And, and to my surprise, people really, there was a real demand for this data. Yeah. Um, people were starving for nerdy, techie details of space launches that weren't available in the, in the usual channels. Uh, and, so, um, and so it spread. And when the World Wide Web came along, I moved moved to the web. Uh, and, uh, and then I started putting more and more stuff on the website with sort of catalogs of space launches and stuff. Oh. And, uh, and that's when, you know, media started bombarding me with, with questions and, um, uh, and space agencies and space companies started sending emails to me to ask for sort of trivia information and stuff like that. And so it's, it's, it's been a great success. It's been a very great pleasure. Uh, and one of the things that happened was because I was giving this information out for free, um, some engineer in some space company somewhere in the world would, would go, well, I appreciate this, you know, here, did you know this? Here's a little piece of info about our satellite. And I would start to get insider information uh, um, that I could then share to the community at large. So I became a conduit for space nerds to be able to share their geekiest pieces of data. That's cool. So how did you specifically like, gather those launch and orbit, orbital data? So, you know, the primary source, right, for space launch information is the U.S. Space Force. Okay. And they operate a, a website, a contractor website called uh, spacetrack.org. Uh, and that gives some basic information and uh, tracking information about uh, launches and satellites. But it's very, it's kind of incomplete. It, it, and it, it, you know, it doesn't give a lot of information about each satellite. So then I go out to press releases and websites and sometimes reaching out to... Uh, uh, to engineers at various companies and, and just research the information uh, on each satellite. So I know what's coming when it, when it goes up and when it's tracked, I can add in that extra data to make. And so what Jonathan Space Reports gives you beyond the, the government site is, you know, all this extra information about who owns the satellite, how heavy it is, how big it is, and, uh, and so on and so forth. And so that uh, lets me um, 
uh, you know, play a useful role. Uh, and it, but it requires a lot of research. It require, and it's not just on the internet, right? Not everything is on the internet. And so sometimes you actually have to visit places and look at documents or, um, you know, reach out to individuals and, and ask them for information. Uh, and sometimes you get it and sometimes you don't. So there's, there's various question marks in the database, which are things I've had to guess. Uh, um, but, and often you can do that based on comparison with similar systems you know, that you've seen in the past. So, so 50 years of experience in this game also lets me fill in some of the holes. So what about like when people do like a secret launches, what do you, how do you deal with, how do you handle those situations? Right. Well, even with a secret launch, they always announce that there was a launch. They just won't tell you anything about it. And it's Okay. hard to hide a rocket launch, especially, you know, from the, the military launch site at, at Vandenberg Space Force Base, right, is just up the coast from Santa Barbara. Uh, they have an enormous, great rocket thundering through the air. It's hard to hide. Um, so, so, uh, um, uh, so how do I get the extra data? It turns out a lot of these military satellites are pretty big. Yeah. If you look up in the sky, you can see them. And so if you know where the normal satellites are and you see one that isn't, you know, uh, in the catalog, then, then you can trace it back. And, and, and also if you have, once you observe something in space and you can calculate its orbit, And then you can work backwards to see where was it over. And so I can, I can go, okay, we saw this bright thing in the sky. And if you backtrack it with the orbit, you can show that it was over Vandenberg Space Force Base at exactly the time that the Space Force admitted they launched something, right? And so that's a slam dunk. Okay, we know what this one is. And, and so tricks like that let us, let us figure out what's going on. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, it's really hard to hide things in space. It turns out. Yeah. So, so there's like thousands of satellites and so much more things in space now. So like, how has the complexity of space tracking kind of changed over the last decade or so? Yeah, there's really two important developments. One is this huge increase in the number of commercial satellites, uh, that just is, you know, a question of volume, right? So I've had to automate a lot of things that I did manually before, because uh, it's just, you know, with 11,000 working satellites, that's just overwhelming. Um, but even more challenging, it's not just that there are many satellites, like SpaceX has thousands of satellites, it, but they're all kind of the same. And so you can sort of treat them on mass, right? Um, I mean, I treat each one and measure its orbit, but I know the metadata is the same, the, the size of the satellite is the same, the owner is the same, and so on. And so that, that, there's some duplication. Um, but some of these rideshare launches, there are like 100 satellites owned by 50 different companies in 20 different countries. And so there, and a lot of them are startups that are just launching their first satellite. And so that's a lot more work. because you have to then go, okay, I need to add this company to the database. I need to research this individual satellite that's different from all the other satellites. It's not just one more of the same. And so, so that's really the challenge is dealing with the increase in the number of players. Okay, so for students and like enthusiasts that are like new to orbital mechanics, like how would you explain the difference between low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, geostationary Earth orbit, and even orbits beyond that? So, and why does it matter where we put those satellites? Right. Maybe the first thing to do is to talk about what orbit is versus suborbital. Um, Mm hmm because I think a lot of people are confused about that. So when you have one of these celebrities like Bill Shatner or Katy Perry fly on one of these tourist Yeah. flights suborbitally, right? You punch outside the atmosphere. You're in space. You switch the rocket engine off. You fall straight back down. Mm So hmm your whole flight lasts about 10 minutes. For a satellite launch, what you're doing is you get to the peak of that trajectory, but instead of switching your engine off, you keep it on, but you start flying horizontally, parallel to the Earth's surface, building up speed until you're going at 17,000 miles an hour. And then you switch the engine off. And now you start falling toward the Earth, but you're going so far sideways that by the time you've fallen a mile, You've gone so far sideways that the Earth, the round Earth, is curved away from you by a mile, and you aren't any closer. And so you can fall all the way around the Earth. But it does require you to have that sideways speed to do it. 
And yeah. how, what is that speed? In the low orbit, it's about 17,000 miles an hour. The higher you go, the lower speed you need uh, uh, to, to make that trick work. Um, so, uh, so a lot of the satellites, the bulk of the satellites now are in this low Earth orbit, which is from about 200 to 2,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Once you get a bit higher than that, the Earth's radiation belts, the Van Allen belts, start to become really intense. And so if you want a satellite there, you can do it, but you it's more expensive because you have to harden it against radiation. You know, it's not going to last as long. Um, it's generally not a nice place to be. And so there aren't many satellites in that region. There are, we do have the GPS satellites in 12 hour orbits. And then, and that's medium earth orbit, right? It's sort yeah. of an intermediate stage where the radiation, that's really the, another way of saying medium earth orbit is in the radiation belts. And then above that, there's this magic height, geo. And there's about 500 working satellites at the geostationary Earth orbit, GEO, which is a one mile thick band around the equator. It's a tiny region and they're all you know, spaced out in longitude around the Earth. And like I said, the speed at which you have to travel depends on how high you are to stay in orbit. And so in low orbit, it's 17,000 miles an hour, it takes you an hour and a half to go around the Earth. The higher you are, the lower, longer it takes to go around the Earth, even though you're going yeah. slower. <clears throat> if you're out where the moon is at a quarter of a million miles, I'm mixing miles and kilometers, sorry, a uh, uh, quarter of a million miles, it takes you a month to go around the Earth. That's what the moon is, right? The moon is orbiting at, 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 at its height. It takes a month to orbit. Yep. So somewhere in between Leo and the moon, there's a height at which it takes exactly 24 hours to go around uh -huh. the Earth. And that's the geostationary orbit. It's at 35,786 kilometers above the equator. And so if you're at that height traveling at orbital speed, which is about two kilometers a second for that height, um, you're, uh, you're going eastward. The Earth is spinning eastward at the kind of the same angular rate. And so you stay above the same spot of the Earth as you orbit around, right? Yes. And so what you've essentially done is you've built a tower 36,000 kilometers, 23,000 miles high. Uh, yeah. And then taken away the tower and the thing you put on the tower sticks there and just hovers above one point on the earth. And so that's super useful because it means you can get your like your direct TV dish or whatever on your balcony and it can just point at one point in the sky and not have to be scanning like it would have to for a low earth orbit exactly. uh, satellite. So so geo is really valuable. And so most of the active satellites are either in LEO or GEO. Okay. Either close to the Earth, where they can see things in detail, where they have strong signal strength from the radio, or in this magic GEO orbit. And then, you know, there are corner cases where it's useful to be in different orbits. And so there are all kinds of orbits that are used, but most things are in either LEO or GEO. Okay, so that's, that's really cool. So now... I want to talk about some like advice from you because you have a lot of experience. So now if a student wanted to, let's say, follow in your footsteps, like analyzing launches or like building space flight databases, what tools or even programming languages do you think they should learn? Right. Well, don't do what I do because I'm, you know, I'm from 50 years ago and I, I use, I still use the code that I've been using for decades, which is, um, you know, C and and other, you know, classic languages. Uh, um, nowadays, if you're starting off, the obvious language to use is Python. Yep. And certainly for scientific applications, uh, the community has really moved to using Python extensively. I still feel there's a case for knowing a compiled language like C. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, that that's still for for like really heavy computational stuff. And also for understanding how computers work, uh, uh, C is a good way to go. But but Python's your, going to be your primary tool, uh, and there are lots of packages available that do it. There's a um, an open source uh, orbit analysis software package called GMAT, the General Mission Analysis Tool, yep. that people might like to play with. 
Um, uh, and uh, there are um, uh, there are a number of like really useful websites. So there, there's a, a website called Celeste Track, uh, Yes, I've heard. C E L E S T R A K, uh, CelesteTrack.org, run by a guy called T S Kelso, and that has a lot of good data, but also a lot of good descriptions and articles about orbital mechanics and what is a two-line element set and what do the things in the format mean and things like that. And so um, uh, uh, so that's a really useful resource. Spacetrack.org, of course, which is uh, uh, the, the government website. Um, there's a great website at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory called Horizons, which specializes in deep space uh, uh, orbital data. And that's much, much more complicated because you don't just have Kepler's laws, something going in an ellipse around the Earth. You have it in some weird path going th through different planets and so on. Um, and so there are a bunch of free resources out there uh, uh, that can really get you a long way. Okay, so as like a final thought, so you've built this incredible resources over decades, but looking ahead, so what role do you see like independent analysts planning, playing in the future of space the governments and like orbital safety and whatnot? Yeah, I think it's all the more important to have independent voices um, as we go into an era where commercial companies are really dominating. And, you know, what they say in their press releases is not always what's really going on. Uh, and so having uh, and, you know, governments have their own agendas. Right. Uh, and uh, even like, you know, NASA is great, but NASA focuses on NASA stuff. It doesn't really have any expertise on, say, what the European Space Agency is doing. Yeah. And so I bring a global view and I hope an objective view to Yep. what's going on. And I think that that people seem to find that useful. Thank goodness. <laughs> and, and so I think that I, the next generation of analysts can carry on that work. And one of the things I'm hoping to do over the next 10 years is start to build a cadre of replacements for me. I don't think that anyone is going to be insane enough to replace me as one person. But if we can get a group of like 20 people together, each doing a little piece of it, uh, I think that, that, that there's potential for an open source consortium of independent space analysts to become a respected view in what's really going on in space, what are the concerns, um, you know, what's the what's the objective answer to people's questions. And and so I think that that will become that will continue to be super important. And so I'm very interested in encouraging the next generation of analysts to, to come on board. Yeah. So, yeah, this has been like an incredible look inside the work of someone who's helped the world keep a precise eye on like what's happening in orbit. So thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. McDowell, for sharing your insights. And to everyone watching, just check out Jonathan's Space Report. And uh, yeah, don't forget to subscribe.